All right. Good morning, gentlemen. Welcome to the West Coast edition of Man Up Monday. Good to see you guys this morning. Let's, uh, hey, Randy, why don't you unmute and pray us in and then we'll jump right into the word. Oh, now you call me on the carpet for that one. <laughs> Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for always being so good. Lord, we are so grateful for you, for all that you do for us, Lord. Lord, thank you for this technology that bring these men together. Um, Lord, we just thank you for um, men of valor and all the people that you brought together to make this happen for us, Lord. Lord, just let uh, whoever's speaking today, let their lips of clay just speak your word, Lord. And... Uh, bring bring the message that only you can bring to us lord in jesus name we pray amen amen thank you randy appreciate that brother hey if you guys have your bibles go ahead and turn with me to the book of second corinthians i'm gonna jump right into um second corinthians chapter five this morning and um i i um I feel like I speak about this topic a lot, uh, but this is important. This is an important thing for me as an individual. I think for us as men, I think for people in general, um, I was having a conversation recently and a gentleman was telling me about um, how he was still struggling with issues from his past. Not that he was struggling with the same issues. He was in one breath talking about victories that he was having over the issues that created past circumstances, but that he was still walking in a lot of shame based upon the circumstances of his past. And, you know, I, I'm privileged and honored. I get to talk to men all the time. I, I get I get to spend a great deal of time um, just kind of being down in it with guys that are struggling. And so I see this happen actually a tremendous amount. And, and I want it, so it's something that I've become very passionate about. And as a result of that, I think I talk about it a lot. And I think it's also something that I deal with a lot. I think that this is something for men. You know, if you ask, um, if you ask men to give us a hundred things that they're doing wrong, you know, a hundred places where they're failing, they could rattle that off just so quickly. But ask a guy to tell us five things he does well, and he would struggle to come up with things that are meaningful and eternal right you ask something you ask a man something that he does well he's going to default to a skill or a gifting you know i'm good at construction i do i can manipulate metal to do certain things i i have this ability uh, i'm an artist i'm a i'm a poet not very often but anyway those kind of things you know guys will lean on their temporal skills but we leave out the things that we do eternal and uh, so it led me to this passage of scripture. This is a passage of scripture that I that I speak from quite a bit, or that I I quote one verse out of this passage quite a bit. So Second Corinthians chapter five verses sixteen through nineteen. We're just going to kind of walk through this this morning, and um, I'm going to hurry because I feel like I have a ton of stuff to say, and I, I want to make sure we get through it all because I feel like this is important because it is such a struggle for us. So. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting to read with verse 16. Therefore, now, therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all of these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their transgressions against them. He has committed us to the word of reconciliation. Paul said that we recognize no one according to the flesh. Why did Paul say this? 
what what was Paul's reasoning? I always try to think of like what was the author's intent? What were they trying to say? Because as a guy who writes, I know that sometimes what's going on in your head isn't necessarily what's coming out on to the paper. I know that sometimes as a guy even who preaches uh, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, there are times that what's it's hard to articulate what's happening in your heart and and how to get that out sometimes and. Um, Part of what he's saying here in We Recognize No One According to the Flesh is he's he's setting up the next point. But part of what he's saying is so that the people of Corinth and so that we today understand that while this is hard to grasp for us, we are not merely physical beings. We are not just physical beings that are having a spiritual experience occasionally. And for a lot of men, unfortunately, you know, they're physical beings that go about their week and they do their things and they do their work and they they take care of the things that need to be taken care of or not. And then they have a spiritual experience on Sunday or will have a spiritual experience on Monday morning at 530. Or we'll have a spiritual experience as we work on uh, the things for the, our MOV 4 or 5 discipleship training. We'll have a spiritual, these occasional spiritual experiences. But I think that Paul here was trying to make the point, or at least it makes the point to me, that we are, in fact, spiritual beings. We are not known according to the flesh. We're not known according to this body. And while we're on this earth, we are having a physical experience, but we indeed are spiritual beings. That is the part that will go on. You have a body. You do have a body. You can touch yourself and and you can feel the pain and the aches and the pain of, of age and, and of work and of all those things. You have a body, but that body will go back to the dust. This physical body will go back to the dust. I think of it like this. It's, this is a tent. It's a tent. And I use the word tent because it's a temporary dwelling place. This is a, a, a temporary uh, shell that will one day go back to the dirt. Genesis 2.7 says that God formed man from the dust of the ground. And then Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 3.20 tells us that all go to the same place, all came from the dust, and all return to the dust. So I bless you with that this morning. Uh, one guy said, and I like this, God had to use something to hold the dust together. So you're just dirt and spit. That's why you're 70% water. You're just dirt and spit. And and it's it's hard to remember that because we so often get wrapped up in this physical experience. We know that we have a soul, commonly referred to as our mind, will, and emotions. It's our mind, our our way of thinking, our will, the, the things that we want to do, and our emotions, which are kind of all over the place at times. And unfortunately, neither our bodies nor our souls get saved when we when we accept Christ. And when I say our souls, I mean our mind, will, and emotions. Our mind doesn't get saved when when we accept Jesus as our Savior we still have to deal with our thoughts. And for some of us, we still have to deal with the images of our past. And we still have to deal with the challenges associated with the memories that we have created over time. We still have to deal with our will. We still have to deal with our desires and our the things that we want and the things that we pursue. And Lord knows we still have to deal with our emotions, whether that be a person that battles with depression or a person that struggles with anger. I don't I don't battle depression much and I don't struggle with anger. It's no struggle. Anger takes over all the time without struggle. Uh, anger is my biggest vice. It is my biggest challenge. It is the thing. It is the emotion that I deal with the most. And unfortunately, neither our bodies or our souls get saved. Our bodies will return to the dirt. And our souls, our mind, will, and emotion, that's our constant battleground. The mind, will, and emotions is where spiritual warfare occurs. That is the battleground. It, you hear often the battleground of your soul. It's talking about your mind, your thoughts, your thought processes, your will, the things that you desire, and your emotions, the, the emotional responses that you have. But Job three, excuse me, Job 32, eight says this, it says, but man is a spirit 
but it is a spirit in a man and the breath of the almighty that gives him understanding that part of us that is god breathed literally is the spirit part of the man that's the part that is eternal that is the part that will go on the remaining part of that genesis 2 7 god formed man from the dust of the ground and then the bible tells us that god then breathed his breath nashama he breathed his into us and it according to job this is the place of understanding the spirit is the place of understanding. So it is the place of understanding that is the eternal part of us. It is the place of understanding that is the spiritual place. So it could be said that the place that matters the most is the place of our spiritual understanding. The spirit is the place inside of you that cries out to God. The spirit, your, your spirit is what cries out to God. It's not your mind. It's not your will. It's not your emotions. Sometimes there's a, an emotional response. And if we're doing it right, we can form our will to his will. And if we're doing it right, we take on the mind of Christ. But the thing that creates that initial response, that initial crying out to God happens from a deep place in us. It's the spiritual place. It's that breath of God place in us. It is the place in the unbeliever that is referred to as that God-shaped hole. It is that void that is left by the absence of his presence. Yet we often lives our, live our lives like we are physical beings, caught up in the temporal, caught up in all of these things that are faded away, fading away. And so we find ourselves, if we're not careful, fixated on the dirt part of us. And I get it. I understand. It is the part of us that we can see. It is the part of us that we can touch. It is the part of us that we know. And even though James 4.14 tells us that life is a vapor, it's a mist in the wind. It's fleeting. It's there for a moment and then it's gone. And everybody quotes that part. That part of James 4.14 is common knowledge. But do you know what the first part of that verse says? It says, you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. We don't know what our life will be like tomorrow. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what the remainder of this day holds for us. We don't know if we will have a tomorrow. And we make all of these plans and we have all of these ideas that are wrapped up in all of these concerns. But... There is nothing that we can guarantee that is going to happen to us. There is nothing that we can be sure of. There is nothing that we can ensure that the plans and thoughts and ideas that we have will come to pass. We don't know what tomorrow will bring or even if there will be a tomorrow. And yet we spend so much time thinking about, worrying about, stressed out about tomorrow. Now, listen, don't get me wrong. I believe that a man should dream. I believe that a man should plan. I believe that a man should strategize. But oftentimes we are doing these things with our body and with our soul. We are planning and strategizing with our body and with our mind, our will, and our emotions. But what would happen if we could rule our bodies, if we could reign in our souls, if we could quiet our minds, control our wills, and heal our emotions? What would happen if we could begin to dream and plan and strategize with our spirit? How different would the goals be that we set if our spiritual understanding that God place inside of us is what we used to strategize our lives. How different would our goals and aspirations be if we allowed that God-shaped place inside of us to be the ruling member of our existence? Paul's next point is a recap of the gospel in just a few words, reminding them of what Christ did. He was saying, we knew the, we knew the man, not just a man. We knew the man Jesus. We knew Jesus according to the flesh, but now he is no longer that. He was alive. He was a real living person and then the cross. And therefore, because of, if anyone is in him, because Jesus was just a man, because Jesus became a man for us, 
And now he is no longer just a man. He's encapsulating the gospel in those few words saying, because of the cross, because of what Jesus did for us, because of the cross, because of the tomb, because of the empty tomb, therefore, if anyone is in him, if they have put on Christ, they are a brand new creation. They have been made new. And yes, even though we are new, we often, so often, too often, let the sins of our past drive us to shame. Listen, the Bible speaks often and powerfully about shame. But it is usually in the context of the redemptive power of the cross. The Bible is making it clear that shame should not be a part of the believer's life experiences. These passages make it clear that remaining in shame actually diminishes the impact of what Christ accomplished on the cross in our lives. Listen, the cross removes condemnation. Romans 8, 1 tells us there is now, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. On the cross, Christ dealt with our sin completely, completely, totally. And as long as we continue to live in shame and self-condemnation, we're denying the fullness of the power of the blood of Jesus. We're acting as if the cross was insufficient to deal with our sin and the consequences of our sin when we continue to carry around the shame associated with those sins. Listen, the plan, God's plan, God's desire, and so therefore what God does when we accept it fully is restoration, not shame. In John 3, 17, Jesus said, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that through him the world might be saved. There is no condemnation in Christ. And yet the enemy uses shame to keep us bound in our guilt, tied up in the chains of our past, separated from God by a chasm of our own creation. God's heart is for restoration and reconnection, not for us to dwell in shame and guilt, not for us to live in shame and guilt over issues that are under the blood. It's what Paul was saying in 2 Corinthians 5.18. Now, all of these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He reconciled us to himself through the cross. Shame undermines our freedom in Christ. Galatians 5.1 says it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. And listen, I know that contextually, this passage of scripture is talking about freedom from the law and not having to be circumcised and not having to follow the rule of law. I understand that. But in the greater context, it's talking about freedom from the curse. Freedom from the curse of sin, because it is that curse of sin that made the law a requirement. So when we choose, and it absolutely as is a choice, when we choose to live as, as though Christ did not set us free and walk wholeheartedly in that freedom, we are leaving ourselves bound to the curse. Isaiah 53, 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Transgressions are intentional, willful acts. Do you know that Jesus didn't just suffer and die for the things that you do by accident? Jesus suffered and died for the things that you would do on purpose. Jesus suffered and died for every vile act that you would intentionally commit. 
He was pierced for your intentional, willful acts of disobedience. He was crushed for our iniquities. Iniquities are our sin nature, the moral wickedness, the perverse tendencies. He died for us because our very nature required a payment that we couldn't make. It required a, a, a bill that we couldn't cover. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. He has already paid the price for everything, including your peace, including the absence of shame in your life. So I want you to maybe, if you're a visual person, try to get a picture of Jesus in your head. And want you to think about Jesus, your Savior, the one who you love. And I want you to think about every mocking word. Every mocking word, every word that they use to mock him and to jeer him and to make fun of him and to insult him. I want you to think about every lash of the whip that came across his back. I want, to, I want you to think about every blow from every fist as they beat him. The Bible says beat him beyond recognition as a man. Not that he didn't look like Jesus, but that he didn't look human. I want you to think about every strike of the hammer that nailed his body to that tree. Every moment of his suffering Every drop of his blood was a payment for every stupid thing that you would ever do. And every moment that you continue to carry the burden of shame, you're making the weight of his cross to no effect in your life. Jesus was pierced and crushed because of our filth and our rebellion. The punishment that he took was the punishment that we deserved. Every hit, every wound, every mocking word, every drop of blood was payment for your peace with God. His blood, his suffering, it is what makes us whole. So there's no room for fluff. There's no room for kind words. You're either healed by his wounds or you're still trying to pay the price yourself for a price that you cannot pay. I recently saw a pretty emotionally charged video, very heartfelt video by a guy that I follow, Preston Morrison. He shared it in such a way um, that you could feel his pain as he was praying. And this isn't a direct quote, but this is what sticks with me because I've had similar conversations with God. God, if you knew all of the wrong that I would do, if you knew all of the evil that would be inside of me, all of the filth, all of the disgusting things that I would do in my life, why? Why would you create me? And Preston Morrison said this. He said, God, told, God responded to me because the strength of my love is greater than the weight of your sin. The strength of God's love is greater than the weight of our sin. This chapter ends with Paul calling us to be ambassadors of reconciliation to a world who needs him. And then Paul's final thoughts before he goes on to say goodbye to the Corinthians for now. He says this, he said, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus did all that he did suffered all that he suffered so that you didn't have to, so that you 
could become righteous so that you could become the righteousness of God by the work that he did on the cross. And as long as we carry around the shame of the sins of our past, we are discounting, disregarding, and making the work that he did to no effect in our lives. So my challenge to you as you go about your day, as you go about your week, is to go. Go. Be the ambassador for righteousness. Be the ambassador for the redemptive cause of Christ. Go. Be different. Hey guys, a few announcements as we're right up against time. Just a couple of announcements real quickly. And Eric, if you want to jump on, if I miss anything, feel free to do that. Um, we are releasing the Men of Valor breakout sessions on our YouTube channel. These videos always post to the YouTube channel. Um, I heard that Travis did, a, or Eric did a great job this morning um, teaching on the, the East Coast edition of Man Up Monday. I, I will catch that right after this. That's already loaded. This video will be loaded to the YouTube channel within a short time. Remember, we have the band app. Our social media is mostly used for promotional material. You can find this and much more, the shop, the the, the MOV shop uh, with all of our merchandise. All of those things can be found on our website, movministries.org. We love you guys. We are for you guys. We are thankful for you guys. And we will see you next week or over on the band app. Uh, let's pray. Let's pray us out. Hey, Father, we love you and we thank you, God. Um, I just, Jesus, I just thank you for the work that you did on the cross. I thank you for bearing a burden that I am just too weak to carry. And I thank you for uh, being able to be different and to walk free of the shame and the guilt associated with all of my stupidity. I thank you that your love is greater than my evil. And I pray that you would cause that to be in the forefront of my memory and all of our minds as we face the week ahead. We thank you, we love you, in Christ's name, amen.